Send you the grace and mercy and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ and this celebratory Sunday of Christ the King. Today, I share with you some devotional thoughts from the Epistle reading, focusing on two verses from Colossians, verses 13 and 14. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Here's the text, please join me now in prayer. Father, our Lord, in this fallen world, sometimes we question your authority and your power, and many times people attack us about whether or not you are all powerful. For we see, O Lord, in conversations that they argue, O Lord, if you are all strong, then why don't you do something? Well, they conclude, apparently your God is not that strong because he does nothing. Help us, Lord, to see you rule even behind the darkness, even behind the cross, that many times you are a king in this world with the crown of thorns, not the crown of glory, which we all know, O oh Lord, you promised to come and reveal that crown in that last day as we celebrate Christ the King on the last Sunday of the church year. This we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Friends in Christ, You'd be hard pressed to find somebody in this country outside of Philadelphia that didn't cheer for the Washington team last Monday night. They were the underdogs. We always like to cheer for the underdog. We want to see the one in power taken down a peg or two. In Dallas, maybe the cheers were greater because Philly's in the same NFC East Conference and enables the Cowboys maybe to get closer to the crown. However, let's focus on that aspect of the underdog. Why do we favor the underdog? Have you ever thought about that? There's an English philosopher in the 1900s. His name was uh, G.K. Chesterton. And he believed that over the course of time, over the course of history, man was being programmed to cheer for the underdog. I don't know if many of you have read the story of the Iliad. I tried to take a crack at it, but it's kind of long and lengthy. It's about the battle of the Trojan War. The battle between the Greeks and the Trojans over the city of Troy. A number of movies have been made about it, but it's not really been true to the book. Throughout the story, when you see the Iliad, there are gods interplaying between the two parties. The war went on for a long time, I think over like 10 years. Why did the war last so long? Because according to Ovid, who wrote the book, the gods kept interfering in the battle. So when the Greeks were having the stronger hand and the Trojans were the underdog, for their amusement, the gods got involved and said, we're going to help Troy and give them some miraculous victories. And then when Trojan got the upper hand, all of a sudden the gods looked and said, oh, the Greeks are getting beat. We want this war to go on for our amusement. So we will go on the other side now and give the Greeks the miraculous victory. That was written thousands of years ago. G.K. Chesterton said he believes that that is the story, that is the epic story, that has started programming human nature to cheer for the underdog. One of the battles in the Iliad was between these two individuals, Achilles and Hector. <clears throat> now, if you know a little bit of Greek mythology, Achilles is half god, half man. His mother was a goddess. His father was a mortal man. Knowing that her son was half man, that he was mortal, Theus, the goddess, took Achilles by the heel and dipped him in the Styx River, which promised him immortality unless he got hit in the heel by which she held him. And you know, throughout the story, that is exactly how Achilles dies. Someone gets a lucky shot in the heel. Hector is the best warrior the Trojans have. 
And after long years of battle, they said, you know, let's just get this resolved by putting the two best guys we got in the arena. Kelly's versus Hector. Whoever loses has to subject themselves to the other country. So these two men went out into battle. And if you know the story, it's kind of like, what chance does Hector have against a semi-god, a demi-god? He's going to lose. Even the Trojans knew that. He was the underdog. And just hoped that maybe the gods would switch sides and favor again the Trojans so that Hector would become victorious. The gods did not show up in the battle. Hector lost. He died. And the story is written in such a way that you grieve over the loss of Hector and what it meant for his country, the Trojans. Chesterkin may have said something here about why we favor the underdog. It's part of our nature ever since this novel has been written. But he goes a step further. And this is fascinating what he has to say. He says, God was behind this story. God was behind this story, setting up human nature to be ready to cheer for the underdog. Because in the future, there would be one who would come as the underdog. His name, Jesus Christ. He would not come in glory. He would come in humility. <clears throat> Chesterkin said, the world, even back with the Iliad, was being set up to cheer for the underdog, even on Christ the King someday. Jesus is our underdog. St. Paul even tells us very truth when he says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. He didn't come in glory. He came in humility. Today, people ask the question, why will people recognize Jesus in his second coming when they didn't recognize him in his first? Because the first time he came in humility. Second time, he's coming in all glory. Speed of lightning and roar of thunder. Just like that theme song for underdog. No question about Christ being the king on the last day, but many question his kingship on the first coming. Throughout his life, Jesus didn't come in a lot of glory. You know, prophecy said he was going to come with angels. Did he not come with angels? It's just that he had the angels show to a select crowd called the shepherds. A lot of people missed it. Throughout his life, he seemed to be the underdog. When you read the story of Christ's interaction with the world power of Rome, especially that of Pontius Pilate, he's a Hector before Achilles. He's got no shot. Unless God would come into this world and deliver him from the power of Pilate, from the power of Rome. And yet Jesus tells Pilate, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. It's not time to wear the crown of glory yet. It's time for the crown of thorns posture of the underdog. He did all this to fulfill what St. Paul tells us in our text today. He came as the underdog to deliver us from the domain of darkness where we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Christ comes in humility to give us the victory. So when you look at what's on that cross that Pilate posted on years ago, he wrote it in three languages. Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. 
Those were the languages of the world. Do you not see irony there? This is the king of the Jews. And not just of the Jews, but of all the Greeks, of all those who speak Latin. Jesus is the king of the world. The crown of thorns is the way Christ comes to win us back. It is his chosen crown at this time. So how did Christ the King Sunday come about when you look at just the story I just shared with you? And you just heard the gospel today. The gospel wasn't about Jesus coming in glory, was it? Did you catch it? It was about Jesus being crucified for your sins. It's like, well, that doesn't sound like Christ in glory. Not to the world. But to us, it's a glorious battle. And God does deliver the underdog wins. But this story of Christ the King covers all what I've just shared with you. 1925, Pope Pius XI introduced Christ the King to the church. Why? He introduced it because he saw the question of Christ's power Be in God? In his own country of Italy, he was circled by fascism. This is not right. This is an unhealthy government. Up north in Germany, you were having the power of Nazism. That is not a healthy government either, Pope Pius XI said. And to the east, communism was on its rise. And to the west, the world was forgetting about God altogether in their religion called secularism. Pope Pius thought the church needs to help the world. It needs to reassure that Christ is on the throne because everywhere I look, he is being dethroned. We need to proclaim the message, Christ is king over all these governments. Matter is how Christ the King Sunday came into play. Which version do we look at and celebrate today? The one about Jesus wearing the crown of thorns? Or the one about Jesus wearing the crown of glory? There was a theologian, a Lutheran theologian, who lived at the same time of Pope Pius XI. His name was Otto Kretschmer. He became a well-known Lutheran theologian and the president of Alba University. What did he see around the world in 1939? He saw trouble. Poland being invaded by Germany, countries going at war, and his reflections on what he was witnessing, he had this to say, little man. That is so true, right? He was communicating by the word little man that we have no control over history. We are just little microscopic things in this whole thing of life. Little man, what now? A long or short war? I don't know. Even a brief glimpse of the hell of man's hate for man is enough. A war fought according to the rules of international warfare? I do not know. It is the last bitter irony that men should kill each other according to rules and regulations. The destruction of our civilization? I do not know. I know only that God is. That Christ died. That there is no hope without him and no peace. That his old wounds are still there. That the angel of death fly more quickly now. That the church has great responsibility in a world that has lost all responsibility. And that despite hate and hell, the city of God will stand. That, I know, is the answer to the question. Little man, very little man, what now? 1939, the presence of World War II. Kretzmann. Crown of thorns right now, people. Crown of thorns. 
not a crown of glory. So what song should we sing for Christ the King? Should we sing a song that comforts us when we're wondering about if Christ is in control of death? A song like, O sacred head now wounded, my Savior be thou near me when death is at my door. Then let your presence cheer me, forsake me nevermore. When soul and body shall languish, oh, leave me not alone. But take away my anguish by virtue of thine own. Never fear, the King of life is here. Or should we sing a song that speaks about our fear of the wrath of God, especially in his coming, in his second coming, in his glory? The time is growing near. Be sober and be watchful. Our judge is at the gate. The judge who comes in mercy. The judge who comes in might. To put an end to evil and die again the right. Never fear. The king of mercy <coughs> is here. Or do we sing the crown of glory? <coughs> crown him with many crowns. Sometimes we may look at the world like Pope Pius XI and wonder, is God in control anymore? Oh, yes, he is. The song reassures us, no matter what we see, Christ is in control. So the question is not, what shall we sing? But the question is, what shall I sing? For no one is in the same season of life everybody else is in. Life goes through seasons, just like the world, right? We have the fall of decay. We've got the winter of death. We have the spring of new life. And we have the summer of growth. So I think the song is dependent upon where you are in the season of life. Because we're not all at the same season. I think the church really tries to reflect that, communicate <coughs> that words of comfort to us as we work through a seasonal calendar, the fall of decay during the seasons of Advent and Lent, that we work through that spring of blossom with Easter, the summer of growth with Pentecost, and the winter of death as well on Ash Wednesday. It's all there. Something resonates with us because we go through this in our own personal life. What song should you sing today? In his name. Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts in mind.